Shalom Aleichem. That means peace be with you. <laughs> I'm so glad that you came. I'm delighted that of all of the cultural events offered in this wonderful city of yours, I mean the cultural delicacy, you have come here for the blintzes and mandelbrot, <laughs> the soul food of Shalom Aleichem. This afternoon, I'd like to share some of his stories with you, show you the town of the little people, Kasserilovka, Kasserilovka, which he loved so well, and tell you of a way of life now gone. And to much of it, good riddance. <laughs> Which nonetheless had qualities that made living at times so sweet, so, 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 so geschmack, so delicious. And at other times, so bitter that we, sophisticated people of the 20th century, seldom encounter. Now there may be some, not in this audience, God forbid, but some who will say, ah, if he's going to show us Kastrilovka, where is the scenery? What Kasserilovka? Where is Kasserilovka? And I'll answer them right away. Kasserilovka is where it's always been. <laughs> <laughs> what do they think that if I would spend a fortune and build right here on this stage the square that marks the middle of Kasserilovka with what? Say, say the market stands here, the stores. Oi, 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 oi. Kopilevich's appetizers with the barrels of pickles and dried herring. <laughs> Bailey's Bakery. Ooh! <coughs> the stables, the stalls. The mick with the bathhouse where the women bathe, huh? Right there next to the poorhouse. <laughs> And if I had real live goats on the cobblestones warming themselves in the hot sun, and the old Kasrilovka synagogue on the opposite side of the square. <laughs> If I did all of that, do they think that this would be Kasrilovka? Of course not. Isn't it written, Da hai lechakime bermize? What does it mean? It means that for the wise, a hint is sufficient. And since I know you're wise, as you must be because you are here this afternoon, <laughs> Shalom Aleichem will give you here a hint, there a hint, here a square, there a synagogue, a forest, in your minds, in your imagination. The oh, Ay! <laughs> the town of the little people, Kasserilovka, into which I will take you, my dear friends, is right in the middle of that blessed place in Eastern Europe called the Pale, where Jews were permitted to live. <laughs> it was roughly the area between Kiev and Odessa. Chernobyl was there. Now, outside the Pale, in St. Petersburg, places like that, 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 they had to have special permits, God forbid. They should contaminate the place. <laughs> but here in the Pale, Jews were packed like schmaltz herring in a barrel <laughs> and commanded to increase and multiply. No. <laughs> increase and multiply. <laughs> Some commands are not too hard to obey, as you well know, I'm sure. It's feeding the hungry mouths, that's hard. Anyway, from a distance, Kastrilovka looks, how shall I say, ah, like a loaf of Sabbath bread with poppy seeds on it. Some of the houses were built on top, some <coughs> along the sides, but most of them were huddled at the base, one on top of the other, like gravestones in an ancient cemetery. What did you say, streets? And in Merle, he says streets. What streets? Where streets? Why should there be empty spaces when you can build on it? <laughs> no, 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 isn't it written? The earth was made to be inhabited, not merely gazed upon. 
That was Elimelech the town planner. <laughs> so they built. They built here, 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 Stuck in a distant corner of the world, far from the noise, the tumult, the hustle and the bustle, which men dignify with the names progress and civilization. <laughs> About the automobile, they know nothing. The airplane, what? To provide for the Sabbath. That's their goal all week long. They labor, they slave, they wear themselves out without food or drink, just so there is something for the Sabbath, for the Holy Sabbath. But when the Holy Sabbath arrives, let your hoopets perish. Let the deaths be raised, let Paris itself sink into the earth. And this is a fact, my friends, this is a fact. That since Kastrilovka was founded, no Jew has ever gone hungry there on the Sabbath. Is it possible that a Jew shouldn't have fish for the Sabbath? No. If he has no fish, then he has meat. If he has no meat, then he has hairy. <laughs> no hairy, then he has white bread. No white bread, then he has black bread and onions. No black bread and onions, then he'll borrow from a neighbor. Next week, the neighbor will borrow from him. The world is a wheel, it keeps turning. <laughs> On Sabbath Eve, in front of the synagogue, woo, you can see everyone in their finest clothes. First and foremost, our own rabbi, Reb Yosipo. <clears throat> Uh, uh, good Shabbos, Rabbi Yosef. Shabbos, good Shabbos. Shabbos, my boy. Shabbos. Shabbos, Shabbos. Good Shabbos. A true man of God. A man over 85 years old, maybe 90. Not the sharpest wit in the world, perhaps, but a good man, a man with no bitterness in him. And sometimes he gets ideas you'd be surprised if you had 18 heads on your shoulders you couldn't think of. Yisruel, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos, good Shabbos, yes, 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 yes. Yisruel, the Shabbos, the sexton at the synagogue. Do you know, without him, nothing can happen. He has the keys to the synagogue. Yet of me emotion with Chavez. The teacher. Oh yeah, how the boys love him. <laughs> Why they duck every time he adjusts his skull cap, I'll never know. Should have shot with Chavez. Chavez? Oui. They call him Shulam Shachna Rattlebrain because, um, well, I think you saw for yourselves. <laughs> Shimineli, good Shabbos! They call him Shimineli Shmakaleno. <laughs> oh, no, 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 not what you think. Oy. Shema Koleinu. <laughs> Shema Koleinu in Hebrew means, hear our voice, O Lord. They call him Shemineli, Shema Koleinu, because in the synagogue he prays louder than anyone else. <laughs> Chavez, Chavez. The Meyers and the Schneiders. <laughs> Actually, there was only one Meyer and one Schneier. But they were twins, and at times it was impossible to tell them apart, so they called them the Meyers and the Schneiders. Their mother, 
was small, skinny, scrawny, but fruitful. Oh. <laughs> Every year, without fail, this little nothing, this little pitskele gave birth. <laughs> but the infants were sickly and they soon died. This happened year after year after year until finally it stopped. No sooner did it stop than she was blessed with twins. Oh, baby. I'm too sickly to nurse two infants at the same time. I'll have to hire a wet nurse. I'll take Meyer. Meyer is a half hour older. And I'll give Schneier to the wet nurse. Schneier is a half hour younger. No. Since the wet nurse was not too healthy a woman either, neither Meyer nor Schneier got too much milk to drink. Well, it happened one fateful day. The women were giving the infants a bath, naturally in the same basin. Who can afford to? <laughs> Look at them splishing and splashing and kicking and kick, 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 kick. Look, ooh, I can swear that this is Meyer and this is Schneier. No, no, this is Schneier and that's Meyer. No, that's Meyer. I can tell by the eyes. Look at those two eyes. What do you mean the two eyes? You wanted to have three eyes. <laughs> no, this is Schneier and that's Meyer. No, that's Meyer, that's Meyer, that's it. They started a fight between them until finally the men came home with a possible solution. Now, the men were very tired because after all, they carry the brains all day. <laughs> Try nursing the babies. The one that grabs the mother's breast must be Maya. The one that grabs the nurse's breast must be Schneier. Simple as that. Wait, why didn't we think of that? Why? Why? No, 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 no. So that's what they did. The moment the infants got close to the breasts, they grabbed and sucked and smacked their lips. A miracle, a miracle. No, what you expect? And just to prove to you that we're right, try switching them around and you'll see. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the poor infants were dragged from the breasts. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> They're sucking hard as ever. <laughs> and ever since that time, they gave up trying, and they called them the Myers and the Schneiders. later after their bar mitzvahs, their confirmation, something did happen that made it possible to tell the brothers apart. It was another of God's miracles. The Meyers and the Schneiers began to grow beards. Meyers' beard was black as ink and Schneiers was red as fire. And who knows what might have happened after their weddings if their beards too had been the same. <laughs> I mean, even their wives could have been confused and not know which is the husband and which the brother. Oy vey. <laughs> well, well, I don't know how it is with you in the big city, but here in Castro, look at the switch. Husbands and wives is unthinkable. Oosh. No, it's not that, but, 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 but that's not the point, so I dwell on it. The real story begins now. The Myers and the Schneiders had a father, about whom I've told you nothing so far, but nevertheless, they did have a father. As long as the father was alive, the brothers got along as one, brothers in body and soul. The moment he died, they began to fight like fire and water over what? Of course, the inheritance. 
Now, the treasure that their father left them was a seat in the old Kasrilofe synagogue. I'm sure you all know that a seat in the synagogue, especially along the east wall, is something devoutly to be wished for. And the closer it is to the holy ark, the greater the honor. Well, the seat that their father left them was not only along the east wall, but two seats removed from the holy ark, right next to the seat occupied by Reb Yosef himself. The father, thinking he'd live forever, typical, typical, <laughs> never indicated who was to inherit the seat, Meyer or Schneider. So what do you expect? The very first Sabbath, after a proper period of mourning, the very first Sabbath, Meyer got up early. <laughs> he ran to the synagogue, sat in the father's seat, and Schneider had to stand at the door. Ha 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 ha. Well, the following week, Schneier got up even earlier, ran to the synagogue, sat in the father's seat, and Meyer had to stand at the door. Ho, 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 ho. The following week, Meyer came earlier, ha, 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 and then Schneier came earlier, ho, 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 and my, ha, 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 and Schneier, ho, 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 ha, ho, ho, ha, ho, ha, Until one day, what do you think happened? Yes, they both came at the same time. It was still dark outside. <laughs> the brothers stumbled their way to the synagogue. Look out, it's my seat. The doors to the synagogue were still locked. The brothers posted themselves there like a couple of roosters ready to tear each other's eyes out. They stood that way until finally Yisrael the Shamas came with the keys. <laughs> no? Mm -mm. no. If the two of you are going to stand it this way, I won't be able to open the doors in the synagogue. We'll have to remain closed all day. Does that make sense? The brothers thought about it. Yisrael was right. So they moved back just enough to let him squeeze <laughs> in the sea. <laughs> and when he got the key in the lock and turned it, look out, you're killing me. You're stepping all over me, the father of a family. But the brothers didn't care about the father of a family and jumping over benches and praying stands. They ran to the east wall, grabbed each other's beards, and pulled Mama with it. Blood ran from their faces. Blood in the synagogue. Obviously, this could not go on. That Saturday night, the Meyers and the Schneiers, together with a group of friends and neighbors, went to the Yosef's house to have the dispute settled once and for all. You know. If Kastrilovka were not such a tiny place, stuck in a distant corner of the world, I mean, if there were newspapers and magazines published there, the world would have surely come to know the works of our great rabbi, Reb Yosef. As it is, that nobody knows about it, except the people of Kastrilovka who know his wonders, who love him and revere him and pay him. Great honor. <laughs> well, of money and riches, there's very little in Kastrilovka. But honor, oh, oh, they will give all a man deserves another Solomon. They said another Solomon. So everybody came to see how the rabbi was going to settle this thing. The whole town came to see. How is he going to divide one seat between two brothers? Ah! Rabbi Yosef will let everyone have his say. He had a theory that no matter how long you let a person talk, eventually he will have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know, that's what happened. They talked and they talked, they argued, they fought finally. Hear ye, my friends, you're both right. You both had the same father, a wonderful man, may he rest in peace. The only trouble is he left you only one seat in the synagogue. What then?
Why did you hear what he said? Why is that Arabi? Shah, Shah Nur Arabi. On the contrary, it's easier for one person to use two seats than for two to use one. For example, he could sit in one seat one day and in another seat the next. But two in one is impossible. Oh. A chair is not an apple that you can cut in two. Oh. But there is a way in which this could be solved. My seat in the synagogue is right next to the one your father left. One of you can have my seat. You can both sit together, but let there be peace among us. And if you ask me, what will I do without a seat, I'll answer you. Where is it written that a rabbi, or anyone else for that matter, must have his own seat in the synagogue? After all, what is a synagogue, huh? a place of prayer. And why do we come to the synagogue to pray? And to whom do we pray? To the Almighty. And where is he to be found? Everywhere. The whole world knows his glory. And if that's the case, then what's the difference if it's the east or the west or the north or the south or the front or the back, the main thing? is to come together with your people and pray. Ah, huh? the following Sabbath, the Meyers and the Schneiers entered the synagogue, and they both remained at the door. anyone here who would like to have his own seat in the old Kasrilovka synagogue? Yes, I mean the one right next to Rabbi Yosef. Go to Kasrilovka, either Meyer or Schneier, it doesn't matter which, they'll give it to you. <laughs> For whatever donation you want to make. <laughs> because ever since that day, neither one of them uses the seat anymore. It stands there empty, unoccupied. What a waste. Ay, what a waste. Incidentally, if there is someone here seriously considering going to Kastrinovka, <laughs> Well, it may not be such a bad investment. I'm sure many of you have heard the story of the poor but wise man of Kasrilovka who sold the great Rothschild, the formula, for eternal life. Come to Kasrilovka, he said, there you will live forever. Because ever since Kasrilovka was founded, no rich man has ever died there. <laughs> And that's true. I mean that Kasrilovka is poor. Oy, is it poor. But honest, there's no thievery there. No one steals anything. That's right. There's nothing worth stealing. There's nobody to steal from. Besides, you know yourselves, I'm sure, that a Jew is not a thief. No, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. 
A Jew may be a, a thief, a thief, Kale. <laughs> but not a thief will come in through the window, stick a knock in your back. No, no. A Jew will. Uh... <laughs> Connive, contrive, maybe finagle a little is a matter of sport. But to crawl into your pocket and get caught red-handed? Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> what will you say if I told you of a theft taking place in Kastrilovka and what a theft? 1,800 rubles all in one crack and on Yom Kippur Eve, the holiest of fast days. Yes, on Yom Kippur Eve, a stranger came to the old Kastrilovka synagogue to pray. He was well-dressed, made a sizable donation. The shamas got him a praise, and, and, and if he wasn't well-dressed, and, and, no, let's not get into that. <laughs> the man wrapped himself in the prayer shawl and began to pray. He prayed all that evening, all the following day, never sitting down, never moving away from praying stand for one minute. Well, you know yourselves that the fast all day standing on your feet is no simple matter. When Young Kipper was over with the final ticky screams, help, help, what, what, what? The stranger is laid out flat on the floor in a dead faint. They got water, revived him. He fainted again. What is it? What's the matter? Some story. This Lithuanian, this Litvak tells them. <laughs> he came to Kastrilovka with 1,800 rubles in his pocket. You know very well, I'm sure, that to carry money in your pocket on Yom Kippur is not altogether proper. Well, what do you mean not proper? It's a sin. And yet, let's be fair, whom can he trust in a strange town with so much money? Wait till you hear what this man did. Hey, only a Litvak could think of something like that. <laughs> best to make fun of yourself, then nobody gets hurt. <laughs> anyway, only a Litvak could think of something like that. <laughs> Listen to this. He took the money into the synagogue, and he slipped it into the praying stand. Now you begin to understand why he never moved away for a minute. <laughs> and yet, during one of the prayers where we have to turn our face to the wall, somebody must have taken the money. <laughs> the poor man screamed, tore his hair. It wasn't his money. He was a poor man with a house full of children. There was nothing left for him to do but to throw himself into the river, or better still, better still, to hang himself right there in front of everybody. Uyve, Uyve, hearing this, the congregation froze, really a shame, a scandal, a theft like that, 1,800 rubles, and where? In the old Kastrilovka synagogue, the Holy of Holies? And on what day? Shamis, lock the door. Lock the door, Shamis. And when the door was locked, Rav Yosef will turn to the congregation. His face was white as the wall. Hear ye, my friends. This is an ugly thing. A thing unheard of since the earth was created, that there should be in Kasarilovka a sinner, a renegade to his people. Heaven and earth have sworn that the truth must rise as oil upon the waters. Therefore, my friends, let us search one another, go through each other's pockets, and you can start with me. And following his example, all the men of the congregation opened their gabardines, pulled out their pockets, searched one another, felt one another, <laughs> until they came to laser yasso. <laughs> no, I refuse. I, I refuse to be searched. A stranger comes and tells the Israel like that. How do you know he says it? I refuse. I refuse to be searched. Laser yasso refuses to be 
sir, should you find your man from a good family? All the important men of the congregation let themselves be searched and not let's say your suit. Either you confess and hand over the money, or we'll take it by force. No, you have no right. No right will show you. They took the young man, they threw him on the floor, and they searched him, and they shook, and they shook, and they shook. Wait a minute. They shook out two chicken bones and a half dozen prune pieces. <laughs> Still moist. Imagine the impression this made. Food in Leze Yassel's pocket on Yom Kippur, the holiest of fast days. You can imagine the look on the young man's face, on his father's face, and on that of our poor rabbi. Poor Reb Yosef will hid his face in shame, in shame. He could look at no one on Yom Kippur and in his synagogue. Reb Yosef will remain to pray. And long after everyone went home to break their fast, Reb Yosef walked home alone, his head bowed, a man of grief and sorrow, blaming himself. Do you understand me? Blaming himself for having failed to reach Leze Yossel as though the food was found in his own pocket. probably want to know what happened to the 1800 <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they were gone, gone forever. money you're interested in. I'll tell you a story <laughs> about Tevye, Tevye the milkman, of course, but this is not the one that you all know so well. This one tells of how he became a milkman in the first place. After all, he wasn't born a milkman. Oh, 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 oh who is? <laughs> <laughs> no one knows that story better than Sholem Aleichem, who got it straight from the horse's mouth. I mean, Tevye's own lips, of course. You hear me, what I'm trying to tell you, Mr. Shalom Aleichem, I'm trying to tell you that if it's fated, I mean, if it's written in the book that you are going to be a winner, you can bolt the windows, lock the doors, it'll come right into your house, and there you are. <laughs> as, as Noah said on the ark, oh, 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 oh. it never rains, but it pours. <laughs> Take my word for it, this is a story worth hearing, but do me a favor, don't put it down in one of your books. Why should the whole world know Tevye's private business? I'm telling you. It was in the springtime around the holiday called Shavuos. Wait, 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 I don't want to mislead you. It might have been a week or two before Shavuos, yes. Be before, before Shavuos, yes. Maybe a week or two after Shavuos. 
Well, don't forget this didn't happen yesterday. Wait, to be exact, it was nine years, no, no, 10 years ago. Anyway, those days, I was not the man that you see before you now, that is. I was the same temper, but those days, <laughs> was I poor. Not that today I'm so rich, but compared with then, there's no comparison. <laughs> those days, with God's help, I starved to death. <laughs> I, my wife and children, three times a day, and that's not counting supper. It's not that I didn't work. I worked like an ox pulling logs from the woods to the railroad station for a handful of coffees a day. Anyway. One evening in summer. Did I say summer? That's right, it was summer. So what am I talking shabuz? It was summer, 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 summer. I was, I was driving home through the woods with an empty wagon as usual. My heart was heavy. My horse, poor thing, was barely dragging his legs. Well, why not? If you're Tevye's horse, you two must know the taste of starvation. All around was quiet. As the sun set, the shadows of the trees stretched and lengthened like our Jewish exile. Night was coming on. Suddenly, my horse stops. I lift my eyes and behold two mysterious creatures coming at me out of the woods wearing the artist's costumes. Thieves, I said to myself, and swinging the whip over my head, I yelled, giddy up, mister, I am an evil spirit. But then a minute later, I said, Pepe, you ass, you fool. Why should thieves and evil spirits come to you all of a sudden? What have you got? I looked the creatures over from head to foot. <laughs> They're plain, ordinary women. Women, one elderly one with a silk shawl, and a younger one with a wig, what they call a shaitel. Both seem tired and out of breath. Excuse me. But could you tell me where the road to Biberic might be? This is the road to Boiberic. Boiberic. <laughs> no, let it be Boiberic. Is it far? No, not far. Just a few miles. Five, six, maybe seven. Certainly no more than eight. <laughs> eight miles? Do you know what you're saying? Only eight miles. What do you want me to do about it? I mean... If it was up to me, I'd make it a little closer. <laughs> but we can't take another step. We've had nothing to eat all day except a cup of coffee and a hot butter roll for breakfast. <laughs> Mrs. the taste of hunger is something that I understand very well. You don't have to explain it to me. It's possible I haven't seen a hot cup of coffee and a hot butter roll or a cold butter roll or even a roll. You know what? Since we're already standing here, why don't we just jump on your wagon and you take a zigzag home to Bibelic, what do you say? A fine zigzag? <laughs> here I'm coming from Bibelic, you're going to Bibelic. How can I go both ways at the same time? Just turn the wagon around and you'll see. <laughs> you can be sure that when you and the Almighty get us back home safely, we'll see to it that your kindness will be well rewarded. <laughs> ah! But wait a minute, tell you, wait a minute. How does it say in the Talmud? A wise man hears one word but understands two. <laughs> rewarded. Why does she speak in riddles? Why doesn't she say what she means? And suddenly, right there in the woods, the thought of evil spirits and goblins comes into my head. Give me, I say to myself, this is not for you. Show the horse your whip and make a getaway. But believe me, it's as if another spirit got into me. Do you know what a dibuk is? <laughs> My mouth opens and out comes, Climot! <laughs> <laughs> the women didn't have to be coaxed. What could I do? I turned the wagon around, cracked my whip once, twice, three times. Who, what, when? My horse doesn't move an inch. My schlamassel doesn't want to move. <laughs> now I really begin to understand what these creatures are. I tell you, tell you, tell you, that's all you have to do is stop in the woods and make conversation with women. Do, 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 do you follow what I'm trying to tell you, huh? Here I am in the woods all around. It's dark, mysterious. And behind me, these two creatures disguised as women. <laughs> Why aren't we moving? <laughs> Why aren't we moving? Can't you see, my horse, my friend here, is not in the mood. He doesn't want to play. 
When you have a whip, haven't you? Thanks, thanks for the advice. The only trouble is that my horse is used to the whip as I'm to starvation. Well, what shall I tell you? I whipped that poor animal to finally, with God's help, we move off the spot and we start going through the woods. And as we go through the woods, a new thought comes into my head to play me. Hey, tell you, tell you. You've always been a pauper and you'll die a pauper. Here something happens that may not happen again in a hundred years. God himself must have arranged it. So why don't you agree ahead of time how much it's going to be worth to you? Stop the wagon, you fool, and ask them plain. How do you spell rewarded in copics? <laughs> but then I say, what good would it do? What if they promise you the whole world on a platter? Is that a guarantee they'll give it to you? Suddenly they stop me in front of a beautiful green mansion. Last winter, I brought a couple of loads of wood to that green mansion. <laughs> A very rich man was living there, a millionaire from Yehupitz must have been worth at least a hundred thousand rubles. He still lives there. Well, I drive smartly into the yards. You should have heard the commotion when we drove in. Mother, grandmother, auntie, congratulations, Mazelka. We were so worried about you. What happened? Tell us what happened. What happened? What should happen? We got lost in the woods until a man came along. What kind of a man? A shlemiel with a shlemazel for a horse. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, they brought lamps out on the porch, put a cloth on the table, and they brought out Hot samovars, sugar, tea, preserves, fresh baked pastry right out of the oven. And then they brought out rich fat soup, <laughs> roast beef, <laughs> stuffed goose, the best of wines and brandies. I stood there on the edge of the porch. <laughs> These rich people of you who can really know how to live, I wouldn't mind being one of them myself. I mean, what they drop on the floor is enough to feed my starving children all week long. Oh God, great and good, kind and just, how is it that to some people you give everything and to others nothing? To some you give hot butter rolls and to others the cholieria, the plague. <laughs> And I say, shut, give me a shot. It's his universe. You're going to tell him how to run it? <laughs> if he want to make it different, he make it different without asking you, shut. Yeah. All right? And yet, what would have been so terrible if he made it a little different? Suddenly, I hear a voice. Where is he, this man? Did he go away? Where is Lamille? Here I am. <laughs> what do you think? I'd go away without saying anything? Well, what are you standing there in the dark? Won't you come out? Let us have a look at you. Would you like some brandy? <laughs> Whoever turned down a drink of brandy, huh? How does it say in the Talmud? God is God, but brandy is brandy. <laughs> <laughs> to your health, ladies and gentlemen, your health comes first. You can always hang yourself later. <laughs> well, won't you eat something? <laughs> a sick man you ask, a healthy man you give. But, but, but wait till you hear what I said. I said, no, 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 please. Don't ask me to sit and eat a meal like that while back home my wife and children. Well, you know, I didn't have to buh, 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 very long before they caught on to what I was driving at. You should have seen them start putting things in my wagon. This one brought fish, another meat, a jar of chicken fat, a keg of preserves. This take home to your wife and children, and now tell us what we owe you for what you've done for us. How do I know what it was worth? I mean, what if I said one ruble when they would be willing to give two? Okay. On the other hand, if I said two rubles, they might think I'm crazy. What have I done to deserve so much money? But my town slipped. <laughs> Three rubles. <laughs> At this, they began to laugh. I wished I was dead and buried. Excuse me if I said the wrong thing. You see, a horse which has four legs will slip once in a while too. So why shouldn't a man with only one tongue? <laughs> the merriment increased. Stop laughing, all of you. 
And with this, the man of the house reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a purse. And from the purse, he took out a 10 ruble note, red as fire. This is from me. And now the rest of you, dig into your pockets and give what you think you should. <laughs> what shall I tell you? Fives and threes and ones began to fly across that table. My arms and legs began to shake. I thought I was going to faint. No, no, what are you standing there? Pick up the few rubles and go home to your wife and children. Few rubles. May God give you everything you desire. Ten times over, I babble, sweeping up the money with both hands, stuffing it in my pocket. May you have all that is good, you and your children, the grandchildren, and great, 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 great grandchildren. Goodbye and good luck, and God be with you. Wait a minute, Rev Tevye. Rev Tevye? I want to give you something, too. Come back tomorrow, if all is well. I have a cow, a wonderful cow, a milch cow. Gives 24 glasses of milk a day. The only trouble is that some jealous person put an evil eye on her, what they call a nine ho <laughs> You can't milk her anymore. That is, if you want to, you can pull and pull and pull and pull all you want, but nothing comes. Don't worry, long may you live if you give us the cow. We'll not only milk her, we'll get milk too. My wife, God bless her, is so resourceful. Every week she makes noodles out of almost nothing. Adds water, poof, we have soup for the Sabbath. <laughs> Goodbye and good luck and God be with you with a light heart and a lighter head. I get on my wagon and head for home singing yay, bye, bye, yum, bye, bye, yum, bye, 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 Muzzled up to you. What are you so happy about, my breadwinner? <laughs> are you coming from a wedding or a circumcision, my gold spinner? <laughs> a wedding and a circumcision both. Wake up, children. And when my crew saw the fish and the meat, they fell on it like hungry wolves, like the children of Israel in the desert. The Bible says, and they did eat. And now I could say so too. Tears came to my eyes. Anyway, we counted the money. There were 36 rubles for good luck. No, 18 rubles for good luck. And 18 more for more good luck. And one extra, 36, 37 rubles. Yes. Now my wife began to cry. Oi, tell you, tell you, tell you. No, then, no, 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 no. Tell me, what shall we do with the money? How shall we invest it? We thought of this, that, the other thing, all kinds of combinations. Be careful, you're going to lose it all. I see. Yes, we argued a little. Yes, we fought a little. But in the end, this is what we agree. To buy another cow, one that really gives milk. Now, I know you may ask, why another cow? And I'll answer you. Why not another cow? <laughs> huh? <coughs> Here we are so close to Boybrick, where all the rich people of Europe it's come to their summer cottages. Why shouldn't somebody be willing to come to the kitchen door with milk and cream and butter? The main thing, though, is that what you bring must be good, the cream must be thick, and the butter must be golden. And where will you find cream and butter that's better than mine? So we make a living. May we all be blessed by the Lord. As often as I'm stopped on the street by rich people of Europeans <laughs> who beg me to give them what I can spare, even Russians. <laughs> we have heard Chekka that you're a good man, even though you are a Jewish dog. <laughs> now, how often does a person get a compliment like that? <laughs> so we're content, may be no worse in the future. I, you must forgive me, Mr. Sholem Aleichem. When I start telling a story, I get so carried away, I forget that we all have our work to do. I have my pots and pans, my milk cans to wash. And you, Mr. Sholem Aleichem, have your books to write. So thank you for listening, Mr. Sholem Aleichem. Well, it looks
looks like our author fell asleep on us. <laughs> Who can blame him? He must have heard these stories thousands of times. I'll tell you what really hurt. This happened in Philadelphia about three months ago. Maybe it was Chicago. No, Philadelphia. There was a man sitting over there. He fell asleep. But he was hearing the stories for the first time. <laughs> You should have heard him snore. <laughs> I can tell you that Tevye was highly insulted. But I didn't mind too much because I knew that his snoring kept that entire section away. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, since our author is getting some shut eye, why don't we all take a little rest, what they call an intermission. Go out, stretch your legs, criticize the proceedings if you like. Why not? You paid your money, you're entitled. <laughs> If you're a smoker, you can have a puff of a cigarette. It's not the best thing for you. But look, I'm not a doctor. It's not for me to say. It's your intermission. Do what you want to. I'll see you back here in 10, 12, 14, 15 minutes. Thank you. in a while followed by a discussion. The discussions were very, very popular after all. Who wouldn't rather talk than listen? <laughs> Once in a while a group of actors from the big city came and favored Kastrilovka with the performers. But in spite of the cheers and the applause, actors and managers did not like coming to Kastrilovka because they lost money there. And not that Kastrilovka didn't like theater, they loved it. The theater was jammed to the rafters. They were simply not educated in certain formalities of theater. For example, why should they come in through the front door when the window was just as handy? <laughs> <laughs> or the cellar or the attic? The front door was used mainly by the well-to-do householders, what they called the govirium. <laughs> and did they pay? I'll ask you, would they have become well-to-do householders in the first place if they didn't know how to handle finagle a couple, three or four free passes? <laughs> One of the few people who paid was Yisruel the Shamus, the sexton at the synagogue, because he didn't want his young son Benjamin, Bin Yamtzik, to miss out on a cultural event. What wouldn't Yisruel the Shamas do for his Binyamtsik, the apple of his eye? <laughs> Binyamtsik, that son of mine is a lottery ticket, a lottery ticket, a lottery ticket! <laughs> That's the way Yisruel the Shamas described his young son Benjamin, who was, as a matter of fact, known as a promising lad when he was still a pupil in Yerachmiel Moshe's Bible school. Cheder, they call him. Yerachmir Moshe, the teacher, could not praise him highly enough. Oh, your youngster is one of the best. He's a hard worker. He's got a head on his shoulders and the understanding and the memory. Oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, 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 when Binyamtsik had been through all of Yerachmiel Moshe's classes, he was taken for higher learning to study the Gomorrah with Eli Meyer. 
Ho, 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 ho. But Ellie Mayer, ho, 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 wouldn't take him. <laughs> in the first place, he said the school is full. And in the second place, he said, well, the shamans couldn't begin to pay what the other well-to-do householders did. So, so Ben Yomtsev did what other boys do. If they don't have enough money to pay, they study by themselves. That's why we have large synagogues with book stands and candle ends saved from the memorials for the dead. And books, all the books you need, Bibles, tracts, commentaries, white knots. You know yourselves that if a person really wants to study, I mean, if he really has the need, he can do it anywhere, even in an attic. Do you know how many great men, geniuses, grew up among us that way? Yes, 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 bent over tiny candle ends in the synagogue. And how many more we would have today, but something happened, how shall I say it, early in the 19th century, the early 1800s. A ray of worldly light stole into our corner of the world. Yes, found its way into our very synagogue, distracting our boys, diverting them from the study of the Talmud. Here, a Russian grammar found its way under the table. There's some writings by a modern free thinker, even a few chapters of a love story. <laughs> well, you know yourselves that from writings such as these, no Talmudic scholars, no great rabbis emerged. Writings like these turned their heads, inspired our boys to go out into the world and get ruined. They became doctors, lawyers. <laughs> writers, and just plain non-believers. Now, Benyamsik was a good boy, but he did not study alone. He had two friends. <laughs> That's how the trouble started. You see, I say that one person by himself can't get into trouble as easily as he can in the company of others. No, 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 this is not an original thought. Look at Adam. <laughs> As long as he walked the Garden of Eden alone, everything was fine and dandy. <laughs> but when Mother Eve joined him, <laughs> the same with Binyamtik. If Binyamtik had studied alone, believe me, everything would have been fine and dandy. But he sat there with these two friends, and together they yearned for this great, bright world of wisdom and knowledge. They sat in the synagogue, bent over the ancient books, but their thoughts were far away. With the great ones of the world, the learned ones, the fortunate ones, listen, it pulled. It dragged at them like a magnet, this outside world. So is it really so strange that one Sabbath Eve, three boys left their study table in the synagogue and disappeared, vanished? They were hunted everywhere, in every hole, but they were gone, gone without a trace. All right, the other two boys were orphans. Let's say there was nothing to keep them there. But Vinyamsi, Yisrael the Shamas turned the town upside down. He calmed down a little bit the following day when a letter was found from the boys telling them not to worry. <laughs> we are safe and sound. We have become aware. That's the word they used, aware, that here in the synagogue there was no future for us, and therefore we've gone to enroll in a gymnasia, a high school, in Vilne, Volozhin, or Mir. They very cleverly put down all three places so that nobody would know where to look for them. Whatever happened to the other two boys, no one knows. But about six months later, a half a year later, Yisrael the Shamas finally got a letter from his son telling him not to worry, I'm finally on the right road. And if with God's help I pass the entrance exam to the university, I will then devote myself to the study of medicine. And when I become a doctor, I'll take good care of my mother and father in their old age. Not bad. And one more thing, my dear and devoted parents, that you must never worry about, and that is my Jewishness, my Yiddishkeit. I want you to know that I pray every day and that I wash my hands before I eat. That is, when there is something to eat. <laughs> so you mustn't worry. The main thing is to have faith in the eternal one who can do everything. 
Not bad. Not bad at all. When he saw the Shamas got this letter, he quickly ran to his good friend Yerachmiel Moshe and said, do, 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 do me a favor, read this letter, and then write him an answer. Uh, I could write it myself, but um, you can do it better. <laughs> Yerachmiel Moshe knew that he was telling a big fib, but, but why dwell on it? He took out his spectacles and hung them on his nose. Not an easy task, believe me, this was an odd pair of spectacles <laughs> held together by two pieces of string and a piece of wire. As for lenses, there were none. <laughs> One frame was covered by a circular piece of tin and the other was empty, just a hole. Even his thrill, the shamas couldn't keep from asking, tell me, teacher, what good are those things? Do they really help you see? <laughs> no, they're better than nothing. <laughs> Besides, I'm used to them. <laughs> and holding the letter off at a distance, one eye closed. Fortunately, the one behind the tin. Yerachmiel Moshe began to read in a loud, clear voice like water running down the stream, stopping only now and then to look at Yisrael as if to say, no, 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 how's that for reading? <laughs> and Yisrael would be back at it as if to say, no, no, and the letter, how's that for writing? <laughs> and when Yerachmiel Moshe finished reading the letter, put away his spectacles, Yisrael asked, no, no, what do you think? Well, it's good, it's good, it's good that he prays every day, that's very good, what could he tell? What could he tell him? Naturally, if it were up to him, he would not have been Yamsik studying in a gymnasium. What does a man like Yisrael the Shamas want to have a son in the gymnasium and studying to be a doctor yet? But Yerachmiel Moshe turns to the wall and sighs. Oh! <laughs> Yisrael the Shamas understands very well what that sigh means because deep, deep inside he feels the same way. But, 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 but still, my Binyamsik, a doctor, he hasn't forgotten. He's still one of us. He still prays every day. No, who was his teacher? <laughs> Don't worry, surely God will help. God will help. Sure enough, a few months later, it was Passover Eve. Sima the Shamister was cleaning up for the holidays together with her three daughters, Pesale, Sosale, and Brokatse. <laughs> when the door opened, and in came a striking young man with a blue coat, an odd-looking cap on his head. See, when the shoppers began to cry, you soon the shoppers began to cry too, but never mind, never mind, never mind. A man doesn't do such things. No, 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 take off your coat, let's see what kind of a suit you're wearing. And when Benjamin took off his coat and stood there with his blue uniform, with the silver buttons, his cheeks rosy, his eyes shining. <laughs> he charmed not only his own family, but everyone who saw him. And Mincy, the neighbor's daughter, a girl of 19, with big, Dark eyes. <laughs> and a thick black braid tied in a red ribbon that suited her so well came in to see if Seema had an extra pot she could borrow. <laughs> Though she knew very well Seema would have an extra pot in her life. But it gave her a chance to look at Benjamin close up, to gaze at him with her bright eyes. And it gave her a chance to toss her braid around. <laughs> <laughs> and to run off, and a while later I'm back again with a different excuse until Benjamin's three sisters looked at each other as if to say, ah, How do you like the way she runs in and out? <laughs> the Lord only knows if anyone else had such a wonderful Passover that year and the following day in the synagogue 
Everyone gazed at the boy in the handsome uniform. And when he began to pray, Oh, what do you think of your strange old scholar? A lottery ticket? That's a lottery ticket for sure. Hey, you're a lucky man, throw it at the lottery ticket a lot. If you did not see Yisrael the Shamas that day, looking from one to the other, you have never seen a happy and a contented man. Well, as bright and cheerful as everything was when Benjamin arrived, so was it dark and gloomy when he went away again. Three years passed, the three years before he could enter the university. At first, he wrote quite a bit, but as time went on, his letters grew shorter and shorter and more and more frustrated, frustrated. This coming examination is my day of judgment because if my paper is anything less than perfect, I know I won't be able to get in. And if I can't get in now, I'll have to wait till next year and next year, who knows what will happen then. Why did I have to work so hard, starve like a dog, freeze day after day? And I'm not the only one to complain this way. There are other boys like me, Jewish boys who stayed over from last year who can't get in because their averages never seem to be high enough. The quotas for Jews are so small, it's impossible to get in. I don't know what I'll do. Yisrael Vishamis went around in the days. He couldn't understand why Benjamin's letter should suddenly become so melancholy. He went to his good friend, Yerachmiel Moishe, to do, 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 do me a favor, read this letter, then write him an answer, and, and, and ask him to explain himself. What does he mean by quotas and averages? And, and tell him not to worry, to have faith in the Eternal One who can do everything. Tell him the main thing is to remember that he's a Jew. This letter was never answered. Neither were the other letters that he threw of the Shamus wrote. But he kept writing and writing and writing until finally, ashamed to come again before he asked me a motion. He gave up writing. Oh, what could be the matter? I see what the shaman said. There's been no letter in such a long time. And she got her answer. No, what do you expect? Do you think that's all he has to do is sit down and write letters? Let him be through with the exams or whatever they are, and then he'll write. He'll write. He'll write. He'll write. But Yisrael, the shamus himself, did not know where to turn. The thoughts that went through his head during those days may no other father ever, ever know. Is anyone here who's ever heard of Lemel the Starosta? Lemel the Starosta, in addition to being the mayor of the town, a man of means and influence, he was also, how shall I say, a gossip. He liked to talk, to tell stories. If necessary, make them up. So you can imagine the excitement when a document arrived from the provincial capital telling him to remove from the roles of the Jewish community the name of the Benjamin, the son of uh, Israel Rittleman, because of the fact that he has embraced another faith. Ah! When Lebel Sarosa finished reading this letter, he quickly ran down the street, paper in hand, gather around Jews, good news. Benjamin, the son of Israel Rittleman, is no longer one of you. He doesn't want to be a Jew to anymore. He has accepted another faith. Another faith he has accepted. Ah, 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 ah. You know, there are times when the days are so still, there's not a cloud, not a breeze. Everything is silent, serene. The people are asleep. The town itself seems dead. Suddenly, no one knows how or why. An explosion occurs like a bomb from the skies, like an earthquake. 
The people awaken. They begin to run. They run here. They run there. The news of Yisrael, the shaman's son, was like that earthquake. It woke up everybody. People began to run. Some gathered in the town square. A shaman's an will a pauper, and he has to be better than anyone else. He has a sense of what does he have to become? A doctor, no less. Another faith he has to take? They don't have enough people to make pogroms on us. They need his help, too. I'd like to hear what that shaman has to say now. Maybe he doesn't even know about it. I don't see him around any place. There were some people in the crowd who went to the synagogue to look for him. And some. Some even went to his house. But they did not find him. The truth is that the very same mayor that had brought the document to the city hall also brought a letter to Yisrael the Shams. It was the biggest letter he ever got from his son. Oh, thank God, a letter from my son, and what a letter on three pages. He quickly ran to his good friend, Yerachmiel Moshe, who put aside his work, put on the famous spectacles, and, and began to read. At first, he read in a loud, clear voice, but then he began to halt and stumble as if he was walking over pointed stones. He came upon strange words, Asian, 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 ah, 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 ah. Emancipation. He threw the shamas sat at the end of the table, his head in his hands, looking right into Yerachmiel Moshe's mouth, listening to every word, trying to catch its meaning. He couldn't understand why Benjamin should have to defend himself, to justify himself, to, to swear in so many words that what he did was out of greater love, out of greater loyalty. Why should Binyamsik ask forgiveness? What was there to forgive? My dear, devoted father, there is no other way. I know the pain I'm giving you. But I have worked so hard, so long. <laughs> my need, my desire for an education have grown so great, so strong. There is no other way I finally had to. What? No! No! Where did Yisruel go? Whom did he see? What did he say? I can tell you only that there were some people who lived long enough to have revenge on Yisruel, the shamas who went around all these years showing off his lottery ticket. It was late in the afternoon when Yisruel, the shamas, finally dragged himself home, half alive. <coughs> he entered without a greeting of any kind, as is proper, in a house of mourning, threw himself on the floor, took off his shoes, tore his shirt at the heart as one does for the dead, and prepared to sit in our mourning. His wife Sima and the three girls did the same. Together they huddled on the floor, moaning, weeping, for the one they had lost. After a while, when Yerachmiel Moshe came, he too entered without a greeting of any kind, slowly lowered himself on the edge of a chair and sighed, and he sighed again. After a while, he began to feel that he should say something to make them feel a little better, but what could he say? When you come to sit with a family who is mourning for someone who has died, you can say, well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Man is, after all, but a fly. Death is something comes to all of us. Any one of these phrases that don't make you feel particularly happy, but if you say something, get it off your chest, it helps, it helps. But what could you say when the family is mourning for someone who, after all, is still alive somewhere? Rahmi Moshe wanted to say something, but the words would not come. He tried several times. This time he tried, and now it worked, but now he was unable to stop. Oh, well, what could you call it? A sign from heaven, for that's what it is. 
Everything comes from him. He is our master and what a master he is. And we willingly obey him. So it was ordained that it should happen this way. And it should happen this way because it was ordained that a thing could happen one way or another way. But if a thing happens one way, how could it happen another way? Yet Achmiya Moshe began to feel that his mouth was talking without him, so he stopped. <laughs> when the hour was up, Yisrael and his family got up from the floor. Each went off to his own corner. Yisrael hurried through the afternoon prayers and quickly ran off to the synagogue to be on time for the evening service. After all, I'm the shamas, my time is not my own. I have to be where I'm needed. Work, work is the only remedy. Someone has to hand out the books. In the synagogue, a couple of old friends came by. No, Sronik, where do you hear from? You're lottery ticket, huh? How's your son coming along? My son? I have no son. <clears throat> In the lottery, Yisrael had drawn a blank. No, let's talk about happy news, huh? <laughs> what news is there of the cholera epidemic in Odessa? Chasing rainbows, huh? Trying to make a killing in the market to make it, to make it, to make it. I made it. <laughs> you know, with my luck, if I dealt in candles, the sun would never set. <laughs> I mean, with me, even when I'm lucky, I'm unlucky. What do you call it when you fall on a feather bed? Lucky. And crack your skull. <laughs> Listen to this. With God's help, I finally put over a nice little deal just before the holiday Passover that netted me a fat few thousands. Naturally, the first thing you do when you put over a deal like that is try to wipe away every sign of poverty. Who wants to be reminded? You do that by first of all paying off your debts and then buying, 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 buying some of the things you've always wanted. I wish all my friends could have had the kind of Passover we celebrated that year. Pish bash, pish bash. <laughs> we were stylishly dressed, ate the richest, fattest, juiciest foods, I tell you. Rothschild himself did not eat better. But with us, all this high living caught up with us. It went straight to our stomachs. May it never happen to you. <laughs> We began calling doctors. The doctors began writing prescriptions. And I began writing checks. Checks, 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 checks. When the prescriptions didn't help, what did you expect? The doctors advised a change of air. Suddenly, the air we've been breathing all our lives was no good anymore. But go argue with a doctor. Or better still, go argue with my wife, Hai Etel, who by this time has become an expert on diseases. <laughs> Believe me, of all the calamities in the world, the worst, I say, the worst is the doctor. 
All right, maybe not so much the doctor as his waiting room, <laughs> where you sweat it out by leaping through an old, old, old magazine <laughs> and looking at a bunch of strange faces. <laughs> you look at them and they look at you. <laughs> Since my wife is not much of a magazine reader, and since she doesn't like to look at people without moving her jaws, <laughs> she begins. You've been coming here long. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Any special sicknesses? This, that, the other thing. My wife knows more about their diseases than the doctor does. <laughs> Anyway, the upshot was that in the springtime, right after the holiday called Shavuos, we would rent a summer cottage in Boyle, leave the big city of Yehupitz, and begin breathing in Boyle. <laughs> the trip from Yehupitz to Boyle by horse and wagon is 30 minutes. <laughs> But to move with wife and children, bed and bedding, meat and dairy dishes, that I leave to my worst enemies. My wife herself turns into a bundle of nerves. Listen to this. While holding the keys in her hands, she runs around yelling, the keys, the keys, where are the keys? <laughs> the children begin to fall and scream, and even I myself, I look around. I forgot to put the rug on the wagon. Now I have to carry it myself. My wife's hat in the box, the canary in the cage. <laughs> no, I say no. You see, there's a rule in our house that no one bears bread. No one is allowed to carry anything except me. <laughs> <laughs> we got to the wagon. I won't burden you with the details of the trip except to tell you the best part was when it was over. <laughs> We came to Boiberic, it was a pleasure just to put down the bundles. I look around, what shall I tell you? These rich people of Yehupitz are not so dumb. The fresh air, you can almost touch it with your hand. <gasps> the tweeting of the birds. Ah, oh, the summer cottage is all in a row like young, blushing brides impatiently waiting for their grooms. We walk through the Garden of Eden like Adam and Eve. The cottage is beautiful too. My wife, God bless her, is not always wrong. The only trouble is that I have a quirk, what they call a mishagas. I don't like to see a wall that's empty. A wall should have something hanging on it, a picture of this or that. So I began to hammer some nails in here, some nails in there. Who's that banging? I want you to go bang your head against the wall. Chayetum, <laughs> go see who that is streaming there. I know it is. It's the lady from Grady, the one whose husband left her and went away to America. She has eye trouble, gets silver chloride treatment from Dr. Malstein twice a week. <laughs> we just got here. <laughs> how did you get all this information? What do you mean, how? I'm friends with all the neighbors already. The women are very nice. One is from Shvedni Rodka, poor thing, coughs all night. Another's from Restopolia, she has a wooden leg. The one from Gradic, that's the one with the eyes. And even the litmus here is very nice. Oh, does she have two trouble? <laughs> no, let them suffer with it. What do you mean, let them? They happen to be very nice women. I didn't say anything. Sha, sha, sha. There's somebody hobbling this way. Oh, it's the wooden leg from Restopolia. My wife greeted her like a long lost friend. I don't know. Who dreamed of this Bidenic? Air schmear, don't you believe it? I've been here a whole week and haven't improved this much. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with you? Any special sicknesses? Won't you sit down? <clears throat> no, thank you. I can stand. <laughs> <laughs>
If only I had one sickness, I'd thank my lucky stars. The only trouble is, there isn't a sickness under the sun that I don't have. <laughs> but if you ask me what hurts, I don't know. The only thing I know is that it hurts. And whose fault is it? The men. Oh, look at him looking. You don't like to hear that, huh? <coughs> and how about having babies? That's nothing. <laughs> My wife and this wooden leg took to each other like ducks to water. And this wooden leg was an expert. She traveled all over the world to her. Rare disease is an everyday word. <laughs> she inspired my higher apple with such jealousy for diseases. <laughs> she couldn't stand it for anyone to have anything without her having it too. <laughs> if somebody had a pain in the side, ooh, I think my side hurts. <laughs> Feet the same ears, those. I've tried every medicine under the sun, but nothing helps me. <laughs> oh, what does the doctor say? He doesn't know himself. He thinks it might be a nervous condition. <laughs> a nervous condition that very same day, my high Ethel came down with a nervous condition. <laughs> Believe me, you're better off remaining unborn than to have a wife with a nervous condition. <laughs> This wouldn't like talk my wife about diseases that never existed. I don't know, maybe you've heard of this one. Listen to this. One day, this woman dreamed, mind you, she dreamed that she swallowed a full set of false teeth. <laughs> Ever since that day, she can hear them clicking away in the stomach. So you can see our summer in Boiberic was off to a good start. <laughs> After a sleepless night, at seven o'clock in the morning, there's a knock at the door. I had to see who it is. I had to. I open the door. Standing in front of me is a bearded old man with corpse-like sunken cheeks, and next to him a short girl with a yellow scarf and a red nose she's wiping with the back of her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you recognize me? I'm Yentl and Zlatan's daughter. This is my father, your uncle Zalbum. Oh, hello, uncle. Huh? <laughs> oh, yes, thank you very much. A week or two or three would be very nice here. <laughs> seen you in ages, maybe 25 years. First, we went to your house in Upitz. We knocked at the door in Upitz, but you didn't answer. Did you answer in Upitz? No, you didn't. Your neighbor told us you were in Bayberg. You, you did not answer in Upitz. He doesn't hear so good. What do you want him to hear? I haven't said anything. <laughs> We wanted to take a cottage in Bybrick, but my father said only here that you'd be insulted if we stayed with strangers. <laughs> I'm not so easily insulted. <laughs> but tell me, who are those people behind you? <laughs> oh, there, they came into our compartment in Kvatsiv. We got to talking this, that, the other thing. They found out that you've become a billionaire, that we're related, that we're gonna be staying with you. Suddenly say they're related to. How related, where related, Deva by they say it's tight as a dot. Tight as a knot. I never saw them before in my life. <laughs> Believe me, they're both pretty hefty. Together they tip the scale at over 600 pounds. Excuse me, but who are you? Where do you come from? Don't worry, you'll soon find out, you'll soon find out. But first, I want you to answer me a question. Your maternal grandfather was called what? You mean Reb Morte? Reb Morte, Reb Morte, Reb Morte. And your grandmother's name was a ba 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 Hanele? Hanele, Hanele, Hanele. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What grandparents you had. What grandparents you had. I know I had a grandfather. I know I had a grandmother. Please tell me 
Who are you? Don't worry, you'll soon find out. It's tight as a knot, tight as a knot. Your grandfather was a Kortishiver from Kortishiver, right? Right. There he had two sisters, Nechamele and Baruchale. Nechamele had two husbands. That is, she was married twice, God forbid. Her first husband was uh, Reb Leibole. Her second husband was Reb Simchale. Reb Simchale had a daughter, Rezele. <laughs> Rezele was married to Mayer from Anastasia. Now Mayer comes from your grandmother's side. You get the connection. <laughs> Tired as a knot, tired as a knot. Just then my wife comes out, she's all washed and combed. Invite your guests for breakfast, they must be starved. You see, no matter what you say about my wife, she has a heart of gold. She knows what it means in the good book when it says to receive guests. Well, what, with a house full of people, I went to wash my hands at the neighbor's pump. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't make a fuss. I stand there mumbling my prayers when suddenly... I, who've never been sick a day in my life, begin to come down with a nervous condition. <laughs> Standing in front of me are Uncle Benish and Aunt Frother with their entire brood. Now, Uncle Benish and Aunt Frother, whenever you go to the houses of Bedlam, a Bedlam, a Gehenna, a Gehenna, I tell you, a Gehenna. They have a house full of children, unkempt and washed, sometimes naked, sometimes scratched, sometimes breathing, sometimes shrieking, sometimes screaming, sometimes whistling, sometimes singing, sometimes yelling, sometimes tying a tin onto a cat's tail. A Gehenna, I tell you, a Gehenna. And now they have come to spend a week or two or three with us. I am suddenly reminded I once swallowed a toot. <laughs> Hello, Uncle Benish and Frada calls my wife. Join us for breakfast. I'll set the table for 20. <laughs> Come, sweetheart, enjoy your summer college. Enjoy, enjoy. Summer college, my thought. This place should have burned down with the rest of my How many times I have to tell you we don't need a summer college? Everybody gets a summer college. You have to have it too. What if they cut their nose off? I became purple in the face. A strange kind of white foam started coming out of my mouth. <laughs> Doctor, God bless him, advised us to drink mineral water in another country someplace. <laughs> My wife, God bless her, found mattresses for Frada and her entire brood. We put Yentl in charge of the house with the guests that are now there and those I know are yet to come. <laughs> and now we're on our way. Where we're going, I don't know, but I trust the doctors will steer us to the right place and put me all right, so I'll bid you goodbye and good luck and God be with you. And wait, 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 since I'm going to a foreign country, how do they say there? Hasta la vista, and bonjour to jour, and arrivederci, and who knows, maybe even shalom aleichem. <laughs>